Judy, tell me what prompted you to create Unpaused? I was asked when I was the CEO of the Great Barry Reef Foundation to go and speak on International Women's Day to the women of Goldman Sachs in Sydney. I was working on a very big project which Goldman's were partnering with us on and they felt it would be good for me to go and talk about the work that the foundation was doing mm -hmm. with the firm. But they asked me also to tell them something of my own personal journey, which in the end caused me to really dig deep about lots of things that had happened along the way. And one of the things that had happened along the way was that I'd had a 15 year gap when I'd stopped a very, I'd sort of stopped quite a stillborn legal career to have these four children. And then I'd come back and little by little built up a network in the not-for-profit sector, which had ultimately led to me being the CEO of the foundation. The women at Goldman Sachs told me when they were asking questions, they didn't talk to me at all about the work I was doing at the foundation. They were interested in how I was possibly brave enough to leave for 15 years. And how on earth did I end up in this what to them looked like a very glamorous and exciting role? How on earth did I pull that off? Because they weren't even game to stop for any purpose, to do extra study, to have a family, to look after a sick relative. They were not game to get off the treadmill. And it was a question that Having, it having been asked, suddenly I was being asked it all the time. Mm. Because, because I wasn't a marine biologist, people would expect me to be a marine biologist when I'd go into a meeting and they'd say, oh, Professor Stewart, you know, welcome. And I'd say, well, actually, I'm not a professor. And then they'd say, well, who are you? And so I'd start this story about I was a lawyer who came to the job at the foundation via chamber music. And it set up this whole conversation and then and so people would say, you know, how do you do that? How do you do that flip from law to music to science? So when I stopped doing that role, I thought I'm going to write this down because it so disturbed me that these young women were just not game to take more control of their life and to make sure that they were doing all the things that a human should experience in a lifetime. You can't just be a working person. There's a lot more to life. With the benefit of hindsight, is there one thing that you would do differently about that 15 years? Well, there are quite a few things I'd do differently, but I think that the, the easiest thing to say that I really regret is that I didn't take an hour a day to work on my career when I was at home with four screaming children. I always felt I was so busy and so pushed and so occupied, but actually I could easily have set aside a small amount of time every day to work on something that was important to me. I should have gone back and done an MBA long before I ever started one. I could have done all of that. And I just didn't have the perspective of the long-term view. If you look at an hour a day cumulatively, you can do an enormous amount in a year. And I think women in family life reach out to find women who they can satisfy something more intellectual in their lives through. And But I look back and I think I could have done an hour less talking. But the other thing that I think can disappear very easily when you leave the workforce and you take that pause is confidence. You mm. lose your belief in your own ability. You become a mother, sometimes that can be a terrible shock, you may not be very good at it, and your confidence gets sucked out of you. Mm. What is your um, understanding of how to retain your professional confidence when you take a pause? Well, I'd have to say that I've been through all of the above. And in fact, my husband and I were admitted to the bar on the same day. And I, as it turned out, I was pregnant and my career went backwards and he went forwards. And so I would find myself as a young woman, a young mother, going to these bar dinners and I'd be treated like a complete moron. And I'd sit there thinking, I've got exactly the same qualification as everybody at this table. And I'm treated like a complete idiot. So my confidence completely plummeted. But 
you feel so powerless. I mean, I had a great husband and he was very encouraging, but you feel so powerless and voiceless. And I think the point of this exercise I've been through is to do a lot more analysis of what assets you actually have in play and what you can do with them. Because I think when you're in that unconfident state, there's a lot of negative self-talk. Whereas I think if you went down the coaching road, a coach would say to you, look, you've got an enormous number of moving parts here that we can galvanise and maybe put together in a different configuration that can propel you forward. Um, so they're the sorts of things that I explore. Now, you mentioned family before, in your case, the four boys. One of the, the new expressions that we're all hearing these days, of course, is the sandwich generation. So you may be looking after children who may not these days leave home until either 27 or 32, apparently, mm. is the new average. And then you've also got parents, you talked about people living longer, who may be living to 100. And so you're squeezed between two lots of people that you may have responsibilities for. Is it important in the unpaused story to look for workplaces that are carer friendly? Yes. I think it's absolutely essential and this is where the bigger corporations can be very um, much more attractive because they have the resources to enable you to shift and pause and restart. It's much harder in a smaller company. Having said that, I also observe that women who want more flexibility are creating careers for themselves on their own terms. There just comes a point where a lot of women will say, I don't want to do this anymore. And I've spoken to a, one woman in particular, very senior position with a very big global firm. And she, she said to me, women don't really leave their careers necessarily for the family because things are a lot more accommodated now with families but women will leave their careers because of their disaffection with the culture mm -hmm. or the, the expectations. They just say, actually, I've looked at what the other side of the hill looks like and I don't want to go there. I want to do something that suits my life. And I think that's a good thing. I think a lot of women are, are taking more entrepreneurial approaches to how they manage a career. Can you stay connected professionally, literally, by being online via Skype and various other apps? Is that important to master technology and not to fear it? Well, I think there are two aspects of that. Um, and two big takeaways are you absolutely have to stay up to date with technology because it's driving so much change and it's creating so much accessibility and permeability, really. So that's absolutely critical. And that's so fixable. You know, those sorts of skills are very available and accessible. But the second thing is that keeping your networks alive or reviving dormant networks can be done to an extent virtually. You can stay in touch with people through these various professional social media platforms. And you can also stay up to date via, there's an enormous amount of ed information and education becoming available via websites, via podcasts. That's a, that seems to be a thing that I notice with women my age, professional women, who in some cases are no longer working. I mean, honestly, they must be spending a lot of time on their own or driving, but they are all the queens of, you know, what are the latest podcasts? And they've, they digest an, an enormous amount of content via, in digital form. And I think staying on top of all of that and feeling like you're tapped into what's current and mm. what's happening, which is um, sort of the, the counterpoint to feeling isolated and alone. So do you have a favourite app or do you have a favourite platform that you use to illustrate exactly that? Well, I am, the, I am completely obsessed with podcasts. I've um, reached a lot of people through their podcasts. You know, I've, people I've been interested in, I've got into contact with and said, I want to learn more. I bought their books. I've mastered some new technologies by myself by exploring it through podcasts, you know, the podcast podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, I really have, and I've enjoyed it, and I feel like it's something I can control, 
and I don't have to be sitting down to do it. So I can move around and get other things done. I spend a bit of time in the car moving between A and B and I, it's, an, it's an hour and 20 minute journey and I make that hour and 20 minutes work all the time. I can't bear to fritter that time away. No, that is very precious time. Yeah. I mean, it's actually very good time, that travelling time, I think, for creative thinking, but as you say, also for absorbing mm. new information from wherever. And not being interrupted, you know, so you can control that flow of information and really concentrate. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Now, in your own pause, in that 15 years where you did also produce Four Sons, you went into the not-for-profit sector and the not-for-profit sector seems to be a very useful kind of laboratory for growing your career back after a gap. I think one of the big unknowns about the not-for-profit sector that I really understand now is that it is expected that every senior business person will contribute to the not-for-profit sector in some meaningful way. So what I learned was, if I had become the most important lawyer in Australia, if that legal career had extended in its usual way, I would never have met the people that hmm. I met through the not-for-profit sector. I was working with you know, the most senior people in Australia at the foundation and learning from them every day. I tried to really soak up from them as much as I possibly could. I don't know how aware they were of the fact that I was, you know, I think they call it trolling now. <laughs> I wasn't quite, I was trolling them professionally. I was, try, I was trying to learn as much as I could um, while I worked with them. And I mean, it was amazing to be running, as a CEO, to be reporting to the chairman of the Commonwealth Bank in his boardroom and watching him run a meeting and managing my dynamic with him. I mean, that was, most people will never see the chair of the Commonwealth Bank chairing a meeting. And my big advice to someone who's really struggling with a pause is to look into a pathway or bridging one career and another through an involvement with the not-for-profit sector. I mean, A, there are huge issues that are being addressed by these not-for-profits that are completely fascinating and needing good people. B, there are really great people who are getting involved in a lot of these issues at, at, on a voluntary basis. And C, you can just learn a lot and feel more valued, I think, you know, by getting involved in that, in that world to the point to the point where I don't think you need to be doing everything for nothing forever. I think that's a really important point, especially to make to women. I think there's a point at which you have to say, OK, well, look, I'm prepared to do this on a voluntary basis to this point, but beyond that, I want to be paid. Mm. And I think that that's a, bit of a, that's a bit of a warning. But from the perspective of the people I met and what I learnt from them in those roles, um, it was absolutely invaluable experience. Mm.